Good morning, and welcome to the second pediatric session. Uh, my name is Arif Khan. My co-moderator is Dr. Hayat Khan. And in, in the interest of time, I'd like to ask Dr. Saeed Muhammad Asad Ali to come up and give his talk regarding the treatment of vernal keratoconjunctivitis in children. Uh, Dr. Saeed is, of course, a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist uh, at Moorfields Abu Dhabi. Dr. Saeed. Thank you for inviting me to talk about uh, treatment of vernal keratoconjunctivitis in children. Next slide. The next slide, it's not working. Yeah. So VKC is a, a recurrent bilateral chronic allergic inflammatory disease of ocular surface, mainly affecting children. Uh, I'll start off with a case, which I've seen at uh, Abu Dhabi. It's a six-year-old Amrati boy, come with slightly reduced vision, uh, more in the left eye than right itching, photophobia, not able to open eyes, discomfort and watering. Symptoms uh, over uh, two years, uh, relapsing and recurring, uh, but he come up with a severe flare-up. Um, he's using dexamethasone eye drops, uh, olopatidine, and ocular lubricants, and uh, on cyclosporin 0.05%, uh, and uh, with no significant improvement. Uh, he is intolerant to uh, tacrolimus. So, so this is his picture of like showing Tranta's dots, and it's a slightly asymmetric disease with the left eye more involved. And uh, even with the full topical treatment, he is still ha is symptomatic. So, what can we do next? So, I'll tell at the end of the talk what I did. So, so it's a relatively rare disease within North America. It's only 1.24. Uh, cases per 10,000 as compared to Africa, where it's more than 400. It's uh, more affect the male children, uh, 3.2 to 1. But if you see an uh, older age group, like more than 20, it affects males and females equally. So main symptoms are like uh, itching, watering, uh, foreign body sensation, burning, and uh, you in examination, there's uh, congenital congestion, tarsal papillae, uh, superficial punctate keratopathy uh, can present with the uh, photophobia and shield ulcers. Ptosis is usually mechanical because of uh, the large uh, papillae. So main differential diagnosis include atopic keratoconjunctivitis in which it inf uh, involves more uh, the lower tarsal and can uh, cause uh, corneal scarring and conjunctival scarring. So diagnosis is usually clinical by the like history, symptoms, and sign. Uh, histological diagnosis can be made with biopsy. Uh, treatment, uh, first of all, is like prevention of avoidance of allergen, wearing protective glasses, swimming goggles, hats, and visors, uh, frequent hand and face washing, cold compression, and uh, ocular lubricants. So topical treatments include uh, antihistamines, mast cell stabilizers, sodium chromoglycate come in two and four percent using four times a day. But these days we are using more dual action uh, acting agents, including alkeftadine, which is only uh, used w uh, once a day, once. And then uh, azelastin now available like uh, uh, preservative free. Olopatidine comes in two strengths like 0.1 uh, and 0.2 percent, and 0.2 percent is once a day. 0.1% is twice daily and is available uh, now in Abu Dhabi, uh, UAE as uh, preservative free drops. Uh, I don't personally use uh, this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They can reduce itching, but there are a few case reports with uh, corneal melt, so we need to look for it. Um, and steroids uh, can be low potency with the less side effects, which is the first line of treatment in case of a flare-up, uh, like uh, uh, lotiprednol or furomethalone, and um, with high potency steroids uh, are prednisolone or dexamethasone, which are also preferred to be used in preservative free form. 
Cyclosporin is used as aminium medulator, and uh, it's used from like 0.05% to 2%. FDA has specifically approved 0.1% strength for VKC, and vector study is used 0.1% strength, and advised like it's four times a day is more effective than twice a day, uh, but twice a day also uh, improves symptoms. So tecrolimus, uh, I use specially in case it's um, associated with uh, lid eczema, and it shows very good response. So we use uh, skin ointment, 0.03 or 0.1%, and can be used in conjunctival sac or the skin. So systemic treatments include uh, like uh, oral antihistamine, in cases of like allergic rhinitis associated with it. Oral steroid is reserved in like short course uh, in case of uh, resistant uh, disease. And systemic psychosporins can be used for uh, seasonal uh, flare-ups. So systemic uh, amino therapies are like uh, omelazumab. It's, uh, it is a anti, uh, IgE antibodies. And especially in cases where the high anti-IgE levels uh, it's mainly treatment for asthma, but uh, uh, it has proven its efficacy in uh, VKC and case series and case reports uh, have been published. Dupilumab is uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies against uh, interleukin-4 receptors, and it has uh, shown efficacy in uh, VKC as well. So surgical treatment, like uh, for uh, shield ulcer, which is without plaque, uh, there is uh, managed conservatively with uh, antibiotic steroid and lubricants. But with plaque, I always do debridement because otherwise topical treatment is uh, not effective. So personally, I have not done any surgical excision of uh, giant papillae. And uh, the case I presented in the start, I, I gave a supratarsal uh, steroid injection. We give it like uh, on the, it's showing it because averted lid, but it's on the superior edge of the uh, tarsal uh, plate. And it's uh, very effective, and I've not seen much uh, raised intraocular pressures. So, so like, like complications are scarring, amblyopia, keratoconus, irregular stigmatism, amblyopia, uh, and complication from steroid. There's a publication from India. It's a big series of 4,000 uh, cases of VKC, and 2.3% uh, had uh, steroid-induced glaucoma, and one-third of them were blind. So prognosis is good, it's self uh, spontaneously resolved, and can 12% can continue in adult age. So in conclusion, uh, it's a, a complex disease affecting many population and can cause irreversible vision loss. A patient and parent should know uh, that it's a chronic disease and with a po possible complication. And whenever you're prescribing steroid, it's very important to monitor to prevent any uh, unnecessary childhood blindness. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Saeed. If uh, at the end, uh, if you can stay until the end, so if there's any discussion points, we can have it at the end. In the interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, and I'll ask Dr. Hyatt, who's here at MediClinic here in Dubai, to tell us about Duane's retraction syndrome. Thank you, Dr. Amri, Myom, and our esteemed um, colleagues present here. So I'll just quickly go in and talk about Duane's retraction syndrome, how to treat. So first of all, defining the disease is very important. It is a mechanical innovation neurological genetic disease included in CCDDs with the limitation of abduction and reduction and narrowing of the palpebral fissure. And retraction of the globe is the hallmark on adduction with upshoots and downshoots. So I'm not going much in detail, but there are type one, type two, type three, and based on the type one where there is poor abduction and good adduction, while the type two has poor adduction and a good abduction. Type three, there is poor adduction and abduction both, because if you can see there, the innovational issue is the key. And when there is a co-contraction of both the muscles, that causes the retraction. And of course, sometimes there is synergistic divergence and paradoxical abduction on uh, attempting of adduction. 
So this is very important to understand and then only we can treat these cases. <clears throat> now, not every case that we have to treat, not every case is a surgical case. This is a left isotropic duins. If you can see here, there is, yes, there is small amount of retraction and you can see the narrowing of palpebral fissure of the left eye when the patient is doing a deduction, but in the primary position, the child seems to be fine. So just watch and these kids remain stable. Another case similar, where you can again see that this is again a very mild amount of disease and we don't have to do anything in these cases. This is a, a good, uh, these are two brothers, twins, and it's an interesting picture if you can see, both have twins and they have what we call a mirror imaging. So they came to our clinic and this is monozygotic unilateral doings type one with a genetic incomplete penetrance and variable expression. But as you can see, there is a huge amount of, um, amount of the head turn. So then definitely these are surgical cases. And quickly going in, if you notice there, both the abductions are limited, which is the hallmark. Now, Sometimes these disease can be bilateral, which I'll take one case where we treated. So now how we new way in which we classify and treat? We need to know the type of heterotropia in the primary position, the presence of compensatory head position, the severity of the retraction on a deduction, the presence of upshoots, downshoots on a deduction, and of course we need to see if this is a unilateral or bilateral disease very important preoperative that we need to inform the family what is, what we can achieve, what we cannot achieve, what are our surgical goals, and we should always, always not try to resect the lateral rectus because that can increase the amount of globe retraction. Now I'll quickly go through some cases. This is a 20, 39 year old female with abnormal head position and in the force primary position, there is esotropia and abduction deficit. What we, what we did in this case, as you can see there, because there's a lot of lead retraction, very simple surgery. We did a left medial rectus recession, seven millimeter, and this improved the abnormal head position and the globe retraction considerably. As I can see, the post-operative results and here you go, the preoperative comparison. The patient was happy and have one muscle surgery help. This is another patient with abnormal head position. Now here if you see the globe retraction on the right gaze has upshoots also. So this is a type one left isotropic duins with severe globe retraction and upshoots and if you can see here quickly there is, of course, isotropy on force primary position, there is retraction, there is abduction deficit, and of course, retraction. So, in this case, we went with a left medial rectus recession six millimeter with rights modification of Hamilton's procedure on the left superior rectus. And we got rid of the globe retraction considerably. So, here's the results. So, if you can see the amount of adduction is still, there is still a, some amount of normal head position post-op, but look at the amount of retraction that has improved significantly and the patient seems to be happy. Third case, this is a bilateral esotropic duins. And again, if you notice in either gaze, right and left gaze, the patient has retraction. And there is upshoots, which are also significant, especially in the left eye. And in this case, we did a bilateral medial rectus recession of five millimeter, and in spite of having esotropic, we recessed the left um, lateral rectus muscles to a small amount with Y splitting to take care of the, the amount of upshoots. And this is the post-operative result. If you can see, the palpebral fissures have improved dramatically. And if you notice pre-op and post-op, the upper is the pre-op and the post-op are just below. And if you can notice there, what has happened is that there is a significant amount of improvement in the retraction in this particular case. As you can see here, comparatively, in both right and left gift position, there is a good improvement and the patient is happy. So quickly I'll go, what can we do about esotropic? We can do recession of ipsilateral medial rectus. We can do transpositions of the insertion of the lateral rectus. 
and whenever there is retraction, we can do asymmetric recessions of the medial and the lateral rectus on the same side. We can always have a full tendon transpositions like the Foster modification here, uh, or we can do Wright's modification of Hamel chains, which is a partial transposition. In cases where you have a large angle esotropia, bilateral medial rectus recessions, posterior fixation sutures can also be helpful in some cases, but I've seen the Y split works better. Exotropic doings, again, recession of the ipsilateral lateral recti and correction uh, that can be helpful. And if you see significant amount of shoots and down shoot, recession with Y split works very well. And for large ones, bilateral lateral rectus recessions. And if there is global retraction, again, we, we, we do asymmetric amount of recessions of both medial and lateral recti. Going on, lastly, on the orthotropic type of doings, we do the Y split for lateral rectus, and this helps significantly. This is uh, how we do the procedure. If you can see that the split has been done, and we have had the, the, four, the third case that I have presented has the same uh, take home message. So, doing syndrome, it's there. We need to know, we need to understand it. And adequate counseling is very important because the surgery will not improve the ocular rotation in all cases. And a proper diagnosis, evaluation, and surgical planning is very important. And individualization of each case has to be taken up. And of course, we have to treat embryo before we treat the patient surgically. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. All right, that's a huge topic and difficult to cover in a short amount of time. but. You actually covered it quite well. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Yihab to come up, please, and give his talk um, about strabismus surgery and diplopia. Dr. Yihab. Hello, good morning. Okay. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, the post strabismus surgery diplopia. The possibility of having post operative uh, diplopia has been described firstly 1855 from uh, von Greve. Uh, it is common, the common example of both operative diplopia you can see after correction of the exotropia, and sometimes yeah, after correction of the fourth nerve palsy by the presence of both operative hypotropia instead of hypertropia. So in a retrospective study between uh, 1978 and 2002, Kushner found that the incidence of diplopia in a studying of 40 uh, of 425 patients, that there is 10 percent incidence of postoperative diplopia. Uh, it was temporary and it lasts in uh, six weeks. Only one percent suffered from interactable diplopia. Uh, the post-operative diplopia is a binocular condition. Yeah? It can be uh, 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 seen in primary position or it can be seen in the secondary position due to lateral incompetence. The post-operative uh, diplopia uh, can be temporary, sporadic, which lasts in few days, or uh, Constants which last uh, in few weeks and sometimes it uh, resolves spontaneously or it need treatment. The interactable diplopia is rare. As I said before, it represents less than 1% of the cases and it is due to either uh, loss of fusion capacity or absence of uh, suppression ability, as well as in cases of horror fusion, where the patients are perfectly aligned after surgery, but they cannot fuse the two dissimilar images. 
diagnosis of post-operative diplopia is taken from the patient. You have to ask the patient if they are seeing the double vision horizontally, vertically, or oblique, or if is, there is any rotation of uh, one image. The orthoptic assessment yeah, uh, to uh, see the angle of the vision post-operatively. If there is any incompetence, you have to examine the eye movement as well as the uh, cyclo-deviation. The, it, is it is important to uh, measure the fusional capacity of the patient and if the separation zone exists or not. The risk factors, yeah. Presence of preoperative diplopia is a high risk factor for getting postoperative diplopia. Others uh, are more liable or like, likely to have postoperative diplopia because the limited ability of suppression, uh, not like in uh, children. The postoperative overcorrection uh, is causing more diplopia rather than the undercorrection. The postoperative diplopia can happen easier if you have a complex strabismus surgery, like vertical strabismus or horizontal or presence of cyclo uh, vertical deviation preoperatively. If the neglect and the, the neglection of correction of any vertical or uh, cyclo vertical deviation while treating the horizontal diplopia uh, uh, give uh, a higher incidence of postoperative diplopia. Thyroid ophthalmopathy is uh, 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 the, the possibility of having both over the diplopia is higher due to asymmetric involvement of the vertical and horizontal muscles yeah, preoperatively. It is very important to remember ambliopia does not protect you from having a post operative diplopia. How to prevent the post operative diplopia? Careful preoperative assessment is essential. You have to examine the patient at least three times before the surgery. Careful correction of the refractive errors are essential. Post-operative diplopia test must be done in all adults, even they are ambliopic. Uh, in this condition, you can see the patient is uh, suffering from exotropia. The post-operative diplopia test is just holding the prism bar in front of the uh, one eye and try to correct the amount of deviation and see if there is diplopia or no diplopia. You can change that to increase and decrease the amount of uh, uh, correction, so to see if there is a higher chance of getting a uh, post-operative uh, diplopia or not. Can, uh, if, Dr. Hap, can we summarize, please? Time. Can we summarize, please, okay. for, for the next speaker? Okay. Yeah. So you can use as well yeah, prismatic glasses yeah, to uh, to see if there is, is a time at the end now. That time oh, is ended. Sorry, sorry, okay. Uh, to correct the preoperative diplopia, you can use as well the ambuloscope here yeah, to uh, use to measure the fusion ability. Uh, using of preoperative uh, prismatic frenal tests can uh, help to prevent the postoperative ambuloscopia and to increase the fusion. Yeah. Treatment conservative if you have a sporadic uh, ambliopia, just assurance is enough. If you have constant ambliopia, you can use an occluded glasses or occluded contact lens. If there is uh, a fusion capacity, then you have to use BRISB to correct the postoperative diplopia. Uh, this is a bangrat folia, and this is a frenal BRISB surgery. You can predict the uh, the possibility of having post-operative surgery if the angle of deviation post-operatively horizontally more than 15 prism diopter or vertically more than five prism diopter. Um, out of respect for Dr. Ajoy, can we summarize, please, so Dr. Ajoy has enough time? We're okay. running out of time. Okay. We're, we're out of time. We're finished. Okay. In interactable diplopia, <laughs> you can use occluded contact lens or in bad condition and interocular 
uh, occluded lens. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ajoy, could you please uh, come up? Our visiting speaker uh, is going to speak to us today about indications for ERG. Thanks, guys, again. <laughs> so I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. So before we go to in, uh, indications, I just want to recap that full-field electroretinogram is a global response of the retina to brief light stimuli, which is delivered from a bowl or a GANS field stimulator, similar to a visual field stimulator. You do testing under dark and light adapted conditions, so you can evaluate rod and cone function respectively. It assesses generalized retinal function of both the photoreceptors and bipolar cells, and there is minimal contribution from the macula. So what are the general principles of ERG utility? The take home message from this slide is that if there is generalized retinal or choroidal involvement, which affects the for retinal photoreceptors or bi bipolar cells, ERG is informative. If it is localized retinal involvement, or if it is optic nerve or ganglion cell disorder, full field ERG is non-informative. So let's go to discuss the indications for ERG based on symptoms and then based on diagnosis. First, based on symptoms. These symptoms, keep in mind, you have to exclude other common diagnoses before requesting an ERG. Poor visual behavior with or without wandering eye mo movements in a young child could be indicative of something like liver congenital amaurosis can benefit from an ERG. Nystagmus in a baby or child, night blindness or nyctalopia, excessive photophobia, visual field loss, especially peripheral visual field loss, and the last one where visual acuity cannot be fully corrected for age, even with glasses. The next set of symptoms, if there is rapid visual acuity loss, which is not due to optic nerve pathology, vision loss over a few months in a child, or an adolescent, it can be indicative of Batten's disease or a macular dystrophy, any family history or any concern of retinal dystrophy, monitoring retinal disease progression over time, monitoring treatment safety and effect effectiveness. In some uh, cases, it could be hydroxychloroquine, which, is, which comes under the preview of drug toxicity, now let's look at some common conditions where ERG can be useful in the diagnosis where I have indicated with a D or it can help with prognosis or severity where I've indicated with a P. So acromatoxia, autosomal dominant vitreoretinochoroidopathy or ADWERC, autosomal recessive, best disease, Batten's disease, birdshot retinochoroidopathy, where you can actually modulate your treatment response based on flicker ERG timings and amplitude, blue cone monochromacy, bradyopsia, choroideremia, celiopathy. So these are disorders that affect the primary cilium. So this could be like barrett beadle syndrome, Joubert syndrome, uh, MKKS. There is a wide range of these syndromes which affect the primary cilium, and all of them can have a ret uh, retinal dystrophy. A range of corn dystrophies and corn rod dystrophies, and congenital stationary night blindness. Please mind you, I've ordered this in alphabetical order, not necessarily in the order of utility. The next set would be enhanced as corn syndrome, fundus albipunctatus, Leber congenital amaurosis, melanoma, autoimmune, or carcinoma-associated retinopathy, metabolic disorders with known retinal involvement, Oguchi's disease, oligocone trichromacy. And then the last set would be retinitis pigmentosa, retinitis punctata albicans, retinal toxicity, Stargardt's disease, 
Stargardt sometimes is a maculopathy or a macular dystrophy, but as Dr. Khan and us you know, discussed yesterday, there can be instances where it can be a cone dystrophy or a cone rod dystrophy phenotype. Vitamin A deficiency, where you can use it for diagnosis if necessary, and you can see the recovery within 48 hours after you treat with vitamin A, and X-linked retinoschisis. Now to end, let us talk a bit about pearls of ERG testing and interpretation. ERG should not be ordered for all cases. It should be judiciously used. ERG should always be interpreted in the clinical context. So please don't interpret just based on traces. You have to take the clinical context into consideration. It is always implied that a trained technician or a trained orthoptist should do the testing. So the International Society for Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision have these training programs which is offered through University of Sydney, which is an online six-week program, which can be a good uh, start for technicians or orthoptists to get into the field. And then, subsequently, there are training on hand, hands-on training programs at various institutions, which is handy. The next thing is ERG interpretation should always be done by a physician with some degree of training or an electrophysiologist. Thank you for your time. Thank you for staying right on time. Uh, I think it's now my turn to speak about... Uh, of course, uh, now we'd like to invite Dr. Arif Khan from Cleveland's Hospital. He's a consultant and a world-renowned speaker. Please go ahead. So, uh, again, thanks again to Dr. Al-Amri and the organizers of MIOM for having me in this, um, in this meeting. I'd like to speak about gene therapy for retinal dystrophy in the UAE, our experience. So there are hundreds of different genes that can cause retinal dystrophy when mutated, uh, but unfortunately there's only one that has an FDA-approved treatment, that is the gene RPE65. So we need to identify these patients so that they get the treatment that they need. We see these patients in the UAE. Uh, I'm gonna concentrate on uh, what this kind of what this particular retinal dystrophy looks like and our experience with treating this disease. So RPE65 is, evolved, is involved in the retinoid cycle. It's involved in recycling uh, vitamin A, and it's its particular mechanism that uh, makes it amenable uh, to uh, gene therapy. Gene therapy is a rescue therapy. It's not a bring back to life therapy, it's a rescue therapy. So when the retina is sick from a deficiency of the RPE65 enzyme, if we can bring that enzyme into the retina, we can save the sick retina before it dies. Once it's completely dead, no role for gene therapy. Gene therapy is a rescue therapy. That's why we need to identify these patients early. Now, how do these patients present? Well, here's a 15-year-old girl who actually came in asking for treatment for retinal dystrophy. She, this is, I'm not making it up. She came in asking for this. These are her symptoms. Actually, this is a pretty nonspecific um, presentation for retinal dystrophy. But I'd like to highlight to you that these, these uh, complaints, that is to say, used to stare at lights in infancy. Vision seemed to approve for a period in early childhood particularly poor night vision, these are recurrent signs in RPE65-related retinal dystrophy. It's not specific, but it's suggestive. And if someone has this sort of profile, it's really important to make sure that they are tested to see whether or not they have RPE65-related retinal dystrophy. Um, the retina in these patients is dystrophic. It's really not specific. But something that's very useful in these patients is the autofluorescence. What they have, which is unique, not specific, but very suggestive, is they have lack of autofluorescence. And you see this autofluorescence image here on the bottom. There's something wrong with it. What's wrong? The discs are white. The discs are supposed to be black when you do an autofluorescence. Why are the discs white? Because the machine has turned up the gain, because there was such a low signal coming from the RPE that the machine turned up the gain and made the discs white. If you go to the unadulterated images, this is the same patient on another machine. Look how the discs are white.
because the machine turned up the gain. If you take the, go to the machine and look at the actual images that have not been altered, this is the actual autofluorescence image with the disc black. There's no lipofusion, there's no signal coming from the RPE. This is very characteristic for RPE65 related retinal dystrophy. There are very few retinal dystrophies that have this picture. Again, just to highlight, this is a normal autofluorescence of a normal patient, short wave autofluorescence. And this is an autofluorescence of a patient with RP65 related retinal dystrophy. This is not just a black square. There's act this is actually an image from a patient. There's actually the disc is there, it's black, but there's no signal coming. Again, very characteristic, very suggestive for RP65 related retinal dystrophy. We have gene therapy. What we do is we have um, Boretogen Nopalvivac. It is um, a modified virus with functional copies of the RP65 gene. It's injected subretinally, and then uh, the, uh, some plasmid DNA becomes a protein factory, makes RP65, and it rescues the sick retina. And this is the one gene therapy that exists in the world that is FDA approved, and uh, we offer it at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. This is the first patient we ever treated. This is a 13-year-old. We treated her in 2019. She had nystagmus, poor vision since birth, poor, uh, you know, and she had a retinal dystrophy. And again, she has lack of autofluorescence and outer retinal atrophy. Uh, we treated her uh, both eyes. Uh, she had elevated IOP transiently. We see that sometimes in these patients. But after treatment, this is what she was able to do that she wasn't able to do before. She's able to ambulate, particularly in dim light. She can see some colors, patterns on shirts. She sees faces. She didn't see faces before. She has better handwriting and reading. Her visual, visual acuity actually improved. Our goal is not to improve visual acuity in these patients. Our goal is to improve ambulatory vision and uh, functional vision. But sometimes we see improvement in visual acuity. And we measure these patients, the improvement in these patients, by something called an FST, which measures the lowest light stimulus someone can see under dark adaptation. And I'm not going to go into the details of it, but before treatment, this was her reading, and after treatment, it's increased a thousandfold, a thousandfold increase in light sensitivity. Actually, we recently did the two year and a half follow up on this patient, and um, the effect, treatment effect, is sustained. So, okay, I don't know, can we go back? Can we go back? Back one more? Yeah, okay. Okay, you can leave it, leave it, leave it, that's fine, that's fine. So everything is sustained, so it's, it's a durable treatment. Uh, to date, we've treated six patients, 12 eyes. We've had a very good result. We have another treatment scheduled in a couple of weeks. I'd like to highlight that there are patients out there, among the patients that we're seeing that have this disease, because it's a rescue operation, it's not a restore operation, we need to get them early to treat them. And um, so be aware of these children who come in with retinal dystrophies. Everyone in the 21st century deserves a genetic diagnosis in general, but particularly we want to identify these patients. Thank you. So I think it's now time for Dr. Ajoy to give his final uh, presentation for this session. So then we have some time for discussion. Thanks again. Uh, again, we'll uh, continue on what's the role of a pediatric ophthalmologist in identifying systemic genetic uh, disorders. So we'll harp on the importance of genetics once again. So I have no, no disclosures relevant for this talk. So ocular manifestations could be the presenting symptom in a range of systemic disorders. These disorders many a time manifest in childhood, and hence a pediatric ophthalmologist could be the first care, first care provider. Today, we'll focus on some examples of retinal disorders that could have systemic implications and could present to your clinic. So this will be a case-based discussion. This is an eight-year-old male. At about five years, his parents say, that his vision started deteriorating, he sits close to TV. Especially in the last six months, vision started deteriorating even farther, faster and he's tripping over objects. 
The child also has become less attentive at school and home. There is no other relevant family history. Best corrective visual equity was 2300, and he had no refractive error. And these are his fundus pictures. As you can see, his disc is slightly pale. The vessels are attenuated. The striking abnormality is at the macula, where there are RPE changes. And you could argue this could be something which is reminiscent for a bullseye maculopathy in either eye. And there are peripheral retinal RPE changes. OCT showed that there is severe thinning of the fovea with some extensive disruption of outer and inner segments across the macula. The ERG was non-detectable, so a diagnosis of early onset retinal dystrophy was made. When we did genetic testing, we got mutation in a gene called CLN3. CLN3 can either be associated with Batten's disease or rarely associated with isolated RP. Isolated RP usually presents later. So this is a child who probably has a diagnosis which will evolve into Batten's disease. If you look at the range of symptoms which has been described in literature, they can have speech decline and cognitive impairment at eight or nine years, epilepsy, five and 18 years, extrapyramidal and motor decline by 20 years of age, and usually they die towards the end of the second decade. This child was referred to metabolics. Within a few months, he developed cognitive decline. He had epilepsy at 10 years on treatment, and currently, as yet, he does not have any extrapyramidal sign. At the last visit, his visual acuity was light perception. So in a matter of a couple of years, he became light perception from 2300. Case two, 14-year-old male referred with bilateral recurrent ptosis. So he was treated externally. He has a history of ptosis and diplopia at age five. Ptosis progressed over time. At eight and 10 years, he had undergone bilateral ptosis surgeries. And he has ptosis, uh, levator function is, still, uh, is not normal. We, acuity is preserved, but he also seemed to have restriction of eye movements horizontally and vertically. When we looked at the fundus, there were parafoveal granular RPE changes and peripheral salt and pepper-like changes. And on autofluorescence, this looked like specks of hypoautofluorescence around the macular region. So we made a diagnosis of probably this is Cairnsire syndrome. We did mitochondrial genetic testing, and obviously there is a variant which could explain the phenotype. This is a recent case, so we referred the patient for systemic assessments because patients who have this disorder are at risk of having cardiac conduction defects, cerebellar ataxia, hearing deficits, diabetes, short stature, and increased CSF protein content. Now let's go to case three. This is a one-year-old female with history of nystagmus and poor vision. The child stares at light, and parents report ocular digital reflex. The visual equity is light perception. If you look at the fundus, the most striking feature is that there is deep retinal white deposition around 270 degree in both eyes. And if you look at the OCTs from those regions, you see that there is hyperreflective deposition in all the areas where this, there is these white deposits. The ERG was non-detectable. A diagnosis of Leber congenital amaurosis was made. And then when we did genetic testing, we got variants in a gene called IQCB1 or nephrocystin 5. The twist here is IQCB1 can either cause Leber congenital amaurosis on its own or can cause senior Loken syndrome, which is associated with LCA as well as nephronothysis or cystic kidney disease. We did preliminary renal assessment at one year. It was normal. The child was followed by nephrology. Currently, at seven years, the child actually developed nephronothysis and is waiting for a kidney transplant. Case four. Again, the storyline is similar. Here you see whitish, silvery white depositions all around. And here you can strikingly see the hyperreflective deposition at the level of the RPE in those areas where you have those abnormalities. This and the child was diagnosed to have chronic kidney disease at eight years and underwent renal transplant. So this whitish, silverish, grayish deposition seemed to be 
I thought at the time may be reflective of NPHP 5. Recently, there was a case. Again, as you can see, there were peripheral reflexes, deep retinal, and I thought, hmm, this is NPHP5. When the genetic testing came, the patient had mutations in a gene called NPHP6, which again, the storyline is similar. Either it can cause Leber congenital amaurosis on its own, or it can cause senior Loken syndrome. So it looks like if you see these type of reflexes, it may indicate a nephrocystin 5 or nephrocystin 6 mutation. This is the last case. This is a 16-month-old female with nystagmus and poor vision since infancy, photophobia at one year. He has fix and follow vision. And this is the fundus picture. So there is this numular pigment clump, very distinct, 360 degree, and Jan fovea retinal, uh, fovea macular schesis. When we did ERG, all the responses to dark and light adapted uh, stimuli were attenuated. At the time, we said, oh, there are two genes which are known to cause numular pigment clumping, but the retina looked too good in the intervening areas, CRB1 and KCNJ13. When genetic testing came, there was homozygous mutations in PEX1, which is a peroxisomal disorder. We sent the child for metabolic evaluation. The child was diagnosed with developmental delay and sensory neural hearing loss, which was a diagnosis after we made this diagnosis of PEX1. Similar case, so when we see these patterns, we look out for it. So there is another patient who had sensory neural hearing loss since infancy and some vision loss. When we looked at the fundus here again, you can see this numular pigment clump. And when genetic test results came, the patient had mutations in another peroxisomal gene called PEX6. So we have seen a list of about 10 peroxisomal patients, of which eight of the 10 seem to have these numular pigment clumps. It could be PEX1, PEX6, uh, or PEX16. To summarize, if you have a rapid decline in vision with bullseye maculopathy and severely reduced ERGs or an electronegative ERG, you should keep Batten's disease in mind. If you have ptosis, plus or minus CPEO, with pigmentary retinopathy in a child, you should keep in mind Cairn-Sire syndrome in mind. If you have LCA with peripheral whitish, silverish, or grayish white deposition, you should keep senior Loken syndrome in mind. And if you have numular pigment clump, you should have paroxysmal uh, disorders in mind, especially if the child has a hearing loss. Thank you, guys. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Ajoy. And we have a little bit less than 10 minutes for discussion. If Dr. Yahab could come up. And uh, if anyone has any questions from the audience. And if not, I have a question for Dr. Anyone, else? anyone have a question? So I have a question for Dr. Ajoy. You know, I have two, a comment and a question. Uh, one comment is um, um, this last one, I think you scared everybody with that last uh, talk, right? Really? Okay. It was not supposed to be scary. It was, it was supposed scary. to be informative. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> scary in a good way. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I have to say that every single diagnosis you've showed there, I have seen, uh, who, and have, they've come initially complaining of eye complaints here in the UAE. So we see these patients here in the UAE. Uh, but at the same time, the vast majority of patients with uh, retinal dystrophies, uh, it, the vast majority of children with retinal dystrophies do not have a syndromic problem. But these kind of cases are lurking among them. So what do you recommend that somebody who's out in, in private practice or in a clinic and they, they have a child with a retinal dystrophy, uh, what should they do? I mean, should they try to... How, how, what is your advice for people? Because, you know, many people are working in, in private practice or they're working in centers that don't have, you know, sub-subspecialty, uh, um, you know, resources. So. Sure. You know, I think the first thing that we ever do is look at the child as a whole. So that's the key. So almost always ask for say, for example, any post-axial polydactyly, any hearing loss, any problems with balance, any known renal, Q 
kidney, teeth, abnormality, any family history of consanguinity. So most of the time, and you look at head size, you look at the face. So in other words, you have a list of questions, sp specific questions, that everybody who with retinal dystrophy gets asked. Exactly. You don't just say, is there something wrong? I, you ask, is there poly was there any polydactyly? Is there any hearing loss? Specific questions. Yeah. Exactly, because most of these syndromic uh, uh, um, uh, associations are because of uh, problems in primary cilium or because of metabolic or other generalized systemic disorders. So uh, I, when the child walks to clinic, I look at the child. I call the child into the clinic on my own because I want to see how the child is moving, is ambulating. And I always, you know, like I'm actually prowling on the patient, to be frank, because I'm looking at what information I can get. And obviously, the key is that when we see some specific retinal signs, even if it's, say, NF1, then we keep looking out for it. So say, for example, the nephrocystin 5, we have a series of six patients, out of which five had the symptoms. But when they grow older, these reflex disappear. So these outer segment, these clumps in the outer segment region seem not to be present when they grow older. Similarly, when the uh, patient with SEP290 showed, I was sure, you know, I, was con I wrote even in the chart, this is NPHP5, and asked for genetic testing, and it came back as NPHP6. So I, I don't, I mean, there, probably there is a link because these both are nephrocystine genes within the system somewhere. But in SEP290, I've only seen in one, one of the cases so far. But the whole point is whenever you see these typical features, to look out for associated symptoms. So one of the child with uh, paroxysomal disorder, for instance, K6, uh, that child parents were fellows uh, from a different country. They have had sensory neural hearing loss from young, young age. And they thought that was not associated. They had eye checkups and they said, yeah, there is some eye movements and this will go away with time. And they came to the eye clinic, the child uh, was six and eight years old. And I saw the numular clumps and I had seen the previous case prior to that. So then I'm putting one and one together because you're saying, oh, this could be a paroxysomal disorder. So always have a high index of suspicion and have a keen inquisitive mind. Uh, any questions from the audience? Or from the panel? Uh, I've got a question from Professor Arif Khan. Uh, <clears throat> for gene therapy for RP65, uh, there are a few case reports about uh, uh, choriretinal atrophy at the site of injection of parafoveal uh, choriretinal atrophy. Have you seen in your case cohort? Yes, you know, uh, you're right. I, in the uh, pre-approval trials, it wasn't really reported, but in the post-approval follow-up, this has been reported of uh, a complication of choriretinal atrophy, sometimes in the center of the macula, therefore affecting visual acuity, sometimes not. Uh, we haven't had it in any of our treated cases. However, there was one Emirati family who uh, went abroad for treatment, and I've seen them in follow-up, and one of them had it, and uh, they, they lost some visual acuity. So um, this is something that um, uh, is possible. Um, on the other hand, you know, um, the natural course of this disease is progressive deterioration uh, to, until complete blindness. So, um, you know, uh, everything has its uh, risks and benefits. This is a, a complication that has been described in some patients um, and has to be taken into account. But in our Emirati cohort, we haven't encountered it, thankfully. It doesn't mean that it cannot happen. Um, I have, uh, if there are no other questions, okay, one question from the audience, please. Uh, is, can anyone provide a microphone? If not, he can use this microphone. Oh, you should have spoken up before. <laughs> so this was a very nice uh, presentation. The question is for you, Dr. Khan. This was a really nice presentation. A quick question, how much does this cost, the injection? 
I'll give you a discount. <laughs> Convention discount. <laughs> uh, you know, it's very expensive, um, and uh, I have nothing to do with the cost. Um, but I'll tell you that um, governments negotiate directly with the companies, and uh, the UAA government has negotiated the lowest price uh, that, at least uh, what I'm told, uh, for any country um, for, the, for the medication. Uh, when it originally came out, it was about, uh, in the United States, it was about uh, $900,000 for both eyes. It's come down so significantly since then. I don't know what the actual price is now, but again, as I said, um, it has been reduced significantly. It sounds very expensive, and it is very expensive, um, but at the same time, it's a one-time treatment. And when you consider that versus some cancer treatments or immunotherapies where people are chronically on these biologic agents getting infusions over years, uh, it can add up to a similar amount of money. I, I do think it is quite expensive. It's a complicated subject. Um, and it's up to governments, I would say, to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies um, to, to provide the service to the citizens. Um, if there are no other, yes. Well, you know, uh, theoretically you can look for in everyone, but, uh, you know, if you want to really be efficient, you want to, you, you know, there's some phenotypes that you see and it's just not associated with RP65 related retinal. For example, if you had tr tremendous retinoschisis, you know, and retinal degeneration, this has never been described with RP65. But... Um, uh, I would say that, you know, most of the time when we do genetic testing, RP65 is on the gene panel already. So it's not really an issue. But the, one you, the ones you really want to test are the ones that have these characteristics. They used to stare at lights when they were young. Um, they might have seemed to improve a little bit, according to the parents, even though they didn't really. And um, this autofluorescence finding of the lack of autofluorescence um, very few retinal dystrophies do that. So it's sort of a triage. I would suggest that every patient with a retinal dystrophy needs a molecular diagnosis in the 21st century. Because as Dr. Ajoy was saying, sometimes you find things that you really didn't expect. And one other thing I'll just conclude with, because I think we're out of time now, and it was what I wanted to, I wanted to ask him, but I'll, I'll just say that in a follow-up to your question. Uh, for example, we see a lot of patients in the UAE with retinitis pigmentosa or retinal dystrophy and hearing loss. Yes. And they all get labeled as Usher syndrome. They're not all Usher syndrome. Some of them are parixomal disorders, which are actually treatable. Uh, some of them are patients who have mutations in two different genes, a retinal dystrophy gene and a separate deafness gene that has nothing to do with it. Um, there are other disorders as well. Some of them are mitochondrial disorders. How do we know? Again, molecular genetic testing. And sometimes it reveals treatable conditions that are only treatable early. So um, whenever I see a child with a retinal dystrophy, you know, these days, although most of them are not, I'm talking about children, most of them are not syndromic, I am an, on edge until I have a molecular diagnosis because I know that sometimes, sometimes these systemic conditions that can even be treatable in the early stages first present as seemingly isolated retinal dystrophy. And I think with that, we've, we've come to the end of time. So thank you everyone for attending and... Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Novart Symposium. I'm Dr. Wasim Al-Trudi, and I'm going to talk about the pitfalls in the management of dry eye disease and the role of Zydra as a new molecule to treat the inflammation. I have no financial interest. And in a recent study in Saudi Arabia, it seems that our region is the highest in the world in the prevalence of dry eye disease. And we know that three out of four patients in our clinic, they do present with symptoms of dry eye disease. In the severe cases, dry eye disease can impact our quality of life to a similar extent as severe angina or dialysis. And in the modern cataract and refractive surgery, it requires a healthy eye surface to start with. In our region, the disease is really very aggressive. It is a disease located over the eye surface where multifactors interrupts the tear film homeostasis that gives symptoms to the patient and in which the tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage plays an etiological role. Actually, who is not at risk of developing dry eye in our modern lifestyle, all of us at risk, how we describe our disease approach, our goal is to restore the tear film homeostasis. Sure, we need to be proactive, measurable, and effective. Proactive, we need to intervene early in the course of the disease before the structural damage happens. We need to adopt metrics in a way that we can establish diagnosis and follow up the treatment. And we need to be effective by differentiating the core therapy and the supplementary therapy and offer both to our patients. In terms of adopting metrics, a simple ones like a questionnaire would help to standardize the approach, establish the diagnosis, and at the same time to follow up the results of the treatment. Another metric is the risk factor analysis, which is very important in the management of the dry eye disease itself. And for the tear film homeostasis, the tear breakup time, whether it is a fluorescein, minimal invasive, or non-invasive, it's a very important metric for the diagnosis and the follow-up. Tear film osmolarity is a point of care test. It's a metric works like IOP and glaucoma. It, it makes like a trend over the time to see if our treatment is effective and it helps a lot in the establishing the diagnosis as well. Whether it's the cornea, conjunctiva, or the lid margin, ocular surface stain is an important metric for diagnosis and evaluation. For dry eye subtype, nowadays tear meniscus height is replacing other methods as a metric in aqueous deficient dry eye. Once it comes to meibomian gland dysfunction, we know that it's responsible for around 85-86% of dry eye disease patients. We need to uh, evaluate the structure by the meibography and we need to evaluate the function by doing the expressibility test and we count how many glands are functioning and what's the nature of the mebum that's coming out of those glands and we will establish my Bomian gland score, which in my opinion, simple, very valuable uh, metrics. Still, the slit lamp, the gold standard, to see if there is any other comorbidities with the disease. How we describe our approach as effective approach, dry eye disease is multifactorial, and we need to address as completely as possible those com contributing factors in order to uh, control the disease itself. Inflammation is at the core of dry eye disease and cannot and should not be ignored. We need to differentiate between the core therapy and the supplement complementary therapy, symptoms should not be simply masked because masking symptoms allow the disease to progress until masking treatment is no longer working. This is the staged management algorithm offered by DUCE2, uh, TFOS DUCE2, and step one, in my opinion, should not be offered for only dry eye patients, but it should be offered as well for anyone who is at risk to develop dry eye patient. Lots of tear substitutes in the market that we all know about, and whether the inflammation is induced by dry eye disease or it is inducing dry eye disease, we need to understand the Vichy cycle of the disease and we need to break the chronic cycle of inflammation and not simply masking the symptoms. Uh, there is a simple test. It's a point of care test, immunoassay, MMP9 test. It's very valuable. And trust me, lots of eyes that I use to write in the chart are white, quiet eyes. When you look in, for inflammation in the proper way, you will find a significant amount of infl inflammation at the eye surface. There is lots of anti-inflammatory treatment, and 
Uh, right now, Zydra is, has been introduced as uh, the third country after USA and Canada as anti-inflammatory molecule. And this is a short video about Zydra. The voice, please. Dry eye disease. It is thought that Zydra targets both inactive and active T cells, thereby helping to disrupt the continuing cycle of inflammation. Zydra blocks LFA1 on inactive T cells from binding with overexpressed ICAM1 on the ocular surface and may prevent formation of a specialized cell junction between specific immune cells, which may inhibit T cell activation. Zydra is thought to inhibit migration of activated T cells to the ocular surface and may reduce cytokine release. Zydra is a first-in-class prescription therapy thought to target both active and inactive T cells in order to interrupt the chronic cycle of inflammation. Zydra has been studied over a large group of patients, 2,400 five clinical trials over one year. In terms of symptoms improvement in two out of four studies, Zydra has showed a relief of dry eye symptoms as early as two weeks. That's a very fast onset of action. And this improvement was there in six and 12 weeks over the four studies. In terms of signs improvement in three out of four studies, Zydra has shown improvement in inferior corneal stain at 12 weeks was observed. And after two weeks of treatment of Zydra, fewer patients, they needed artificial tears comparing to vehicle. And once it comes to safety and tolerability, uh, the, the most adverse side effect of Zydra it were a burning sensation, blurry vision, and dysgasia. And most of the patient, they have described this as mild to moderate in Sonata study. And right now, I'm going to share three cases with you clinical cases. Case number one, for 52 years old female, she has a history of both eyes, cataract surgery with multifocal IOL. She has mid negative medical history, and she is using lubricant eye drops with lid hygiene. She is complaining of burning sensation, foreign body sensation, watery eyes. She's not happy with her vision after the cataract and the multifocal uh, lens. What are the risk factors in this case? Age, gender, female, and she, uh, the cataract surgery, the environment, AC, low humidity, and she is using this Arabic kohal, which is composite of uh, heavy metals. Screening for symptoms, DEQ5 score of 14 was in favor of dry eye disease, and here you can see the tear film breakup time. It's less than 10 seconds. Corneal stain was positive. Tear film osmolarity was positive for dry eye, and the tear meniscus height was normal. This is the slit lamp examination. As you can see, the lid margin, significant amount of uh, telangiectasia, some capping in the meibomian gland orifices, and some element of blepharitis. The fellow eye is presenting the same picture. Meibography is showing a dropout and structural changes of the glands, and meibomian gland score was 18. Once you look for inflammation in such a white, quiet eyes, you find that it is presenting a significant amount of inflammation. So the diagnosis of evaporative dry eye disease, meibomian glands function with mild blepharitis was established. The treatment strategy, I call it the basic package plus risk factor modification, education about the condition, topical preservative free artificial tears, omega-3 fatty acid, add some humidity to the environment and reduce the use of the makeup if possible. Breaking the cycle of inflammation, the patient uh, was put on Zydra twice per day and short-term steroid for two weeks to kickstart the treatment. Offering the core therapy and the supplementary therapy, the patient underwent blepharomicro exfoliation to clear the biofilm and the blepharitis, then uh, home lid hygiene with eyelid wipes, IBL treatment because she has a heavy eyelid margin, telangiectasia, and lippy flow, Victor thermal pulsation to clear the blocked glands. Three months after the uh, treatment, the eye surface has got better. Can, you can see, evaluate, appreciate the lid margin. Inflammation has got better as well as per MMP9 test. And the meibomian gland score increased, in, increased to 27. Osmolarity back to normal and the DEQ5 score, it has been reduced to six. That concludes case number one. Case number two, 60 years old female with rheumatoid arthritis, facial rosacea. She is on hydroxychloroquine treatment. She is complaining of redness in the morning, watery eyes, burning sensation, crusty lashes. 
uh, and her symptoms has got worse after her left eye cataract surgery. What are the risk factors here? Again, age, female, autoimmune disease, facial rosacea, important source of inflammation, environment, and the cataract surgery in her left eye. Symptom screening, OSDI score was 50 in favor of dry eye disease. Tear breakup time less than 10 seconds. Tear film osmolarity, there is a difference between both eyes of eight milliosmol per milliliter. That's diagnosis of dry eye disease. Slit lamp examination, as you can see, heavy, uh, I believe, cholerates on the lashes. Uh, this is an indication for demodex blepharitis, lid margin telangiectasia, scleromalacia because of the uh, autoimmune disease. Mybography is showing some atrophy as well of the glands and the evaluation of the mybomian gland score, it was around nine. Around three acceptable glands out of 15 challenged and the mebom grade is three. Looking for inflammation, positive MMP9 test, the diagnosis of dry eye disease, mybomian gland dysfunction, demodex blepharitis in an immunocompromised patient. Treatment strategy, basic package again, plus the risk factor modification. The patient was referred to her dermatologist as well to, to deal with her rosacea and breaking the cycle of inflammation. Again, Zydra twice per day, short-term steroid to kickstart the treatment. The core therapy, supplementary therapy, blepharomicro exfoliation to clear the blepharitis, then uh, uh, eyelid hygiene at home with eye wipes with tea tree oil because we are suspecting here demodex, IPL treatment, heavy lid margin telangiectasia, demodex blepharitis, and rosacea. IPL is very effective here, and lippy flow to clear the blocked glands. This is immediately after the blepharomicro exfoliation, you appreciate the lid margin, and uh, trust me, once we remove the cholerates from the roots of the lashes in such an immunocompromised patient with heavy infestation of demodex, I believe you can peel off with the aid of tying forceps those small mites from the roots of the lashes as I am doing here. Three months later, the mybomian gland score has improved to 21. Her symptoms improved. Inflammation has got better as well. Case number three, this is one of the few cases that we can get away only with uh, the supplementary treatment. She is for a 30 years old female. She works as digital marketing. She has negative medical history. She was in birth control treatment, and she is using over-the-counter eye lubricant with preservatives. She's complaining of burning sensation, eye fatigue, fluctuation of vision. What are the risk factors? Long screen time, female, she is on oral offensive medications for dry eye disease, her diet and lifestyle, junk food, low omega-3, and the environment, low humidity. Symptoms, OSDI score 31.5 in favor of dry eye, slit lamp examination, as you can see, nothing crazy and ocular surface stain. It was free for stain, only the tear breakup time as homeostasis marker was positive, as you can see here. MMP9 looking for inflammation, it was negative, tear meniscus height normal, osmolarity is normal. To evaluate my Bomian gland, the score it was 39, good amount of the 15 challenged uh, glands, they were uh, producing a clear oil, so we had a good score of mybomian glands. An evaporative dry eye established as diagnosis, and here we can get away with our basic package. It's important for the risk factor modification. Uh, uh, here, uh, she was shifted from the oral birth control to IUD device, and she was advised to do mindful blinking, reduce the screen time, lower the screen position below the line of sight, warm compresses at home, and lid hygiene therapy. Take home message, dry eye is multifactorial and requires a holistic approach. Anti-inflammatory treatment 
is essential in dry eye disease, we need to understand and offer our patient the core therapy and the supplementary therapy to address all the comorbidities with the disease, and we need to adopt metrics to standardize our approach and evaluate our success of treatment. We need to customize our approach because I believe in our region, dry eye disease is very aggressive and it requires a different approach from other areas in the world. And thank you so much for your attention. I think we have a minute if there is any question. So thank you so much. I leave the stage for the next session.